Hello and welcome to a very special How I Paint Things. Now what I've got in front of me here is one of the British riflemen from Gloom Trench 1926. Now I'll pop some links in the description so that you can go and check those out for yourself. And this fella, he is a 3D print, but bearing in mind, Fickle Dice, who are the team behind Gloom Trench, they've got licensed printers all around the world, including New Zealand. So you Kiwi folks who, oh, I still remember the old country, <laughs> you're not going to miss out. Now, I was asked if I would have a go at some alternate color schemes, and I got thinking about urban combat in you know, the First World War and beyond. And I thought, well, why not do something in that vein with the Gloom Trench guys? So, as always, all of the paints for this will be listed in the description below. Let's get started. Now, obviously, the first place to start is in priming our miniature. And here I've used the Rattlecan Grey from Vallejo. It doesn't matter what grey you use, you could use uh, the Army Painter's Uniform Grey or Mechanica Standard Grey from Citadel or any grey. Uh, you could even use a white if you fancy, I just recommend that something middling to light is going to be simpler to add some of our colours over than starting from black. Could start from black, uh, but this will be easier, so any grey you like, go ahead, prime with that. Now we're going to start by painting possibly the most important detail on the entire miniature with some tanned flesh from the army painter, his finger. Now, obviously if you've got a fella who has his face exposed, uh, then this would be when to base coat that as well. But do bear in mind, all of the British riflemen in the range have their trigger finger exposed, which is a nice little touch. Now we'll move on to his uniform. Now here I'm going to use Luftwaffe Blue, which obviously with a name like that is intended for German uniforms. Uh, but in 1926, even in this fictional universe, I suspect the Luftwaffe doesn't exist quite as we're used to. Now I am using blue here uh, mostly because civil defense uniforms, like wardens and such like that in Britain, uh, they wore blue uniforms too. So if I were an army provisioner looking for something to kit out a team for urban infiltration or something like that, uh, this might be what I was looking for. Something blue. Mostly, it also just looks cool. It's a little bit different than the usual battle dress, and it lets us lean into that urban combat look. Now, once you're satisfied, you've got all of the bits of uniform. Make sure any bits that are poking through in his cape are also done. What I'm going to move on to is his webbing. Now this time I'm using medium grey from Vallejo. Uh, British webbing was manufactured from a sort of canvas material, and it was a, a raw, plain canvas. Uh, what would happen is that it would get issued to fellows who then had to work this material called Blanco into the, the canvas to protect it. It basically stopped it from rotting and what have you. And early on, and particularly when you look at uh, World War II, it was a beige yellowy sort of color, which you might have seen in previous versions of this that I've done. Um, but later on in the war, they would issue a green version. Basically, in the Second World War, the further forward in time you go, the more green things got. But I think for our purposes, this fellow having untreated, you know, raw plain canvas for his webbing kind of makes sense. Let's just say it's war shortages. Now the other nice thing about medium grey is that it covers super well. What I'm going to use now is Karak Stone, and this is quite a similar colour. It's just a little bit lighter and a slight touch more yellow. I'm going to use this on his putties and on the visible parts of his face mask. So I'm not worried if I hit his eyes or the canister on the front there. Uh, if you did want to use the same colour for both the webbing and all of these details, Probably not going to matter too much, I just want a tiny bit of variety. Now, right now that's not going to look terribly different, but once we finish shading and then highlighting the uh, webbing, it's going to look different enough that you know, there's a bit of variety there. What I've got now is Iron Hand Steel, and this is a wonderful metal color when you can just plonk it down, shade it, and you ordinarily don't need to come back and highlight it if you don't want to. So I am going to paint in his uh, chainmail and this pretty wicked looking trench blade on his hip here. Now for all we've ventured outside the realm of history for some of the colors on this dude, I can't imagine they're likely to paint his rifle. So we're gonna get beige brown, which is a wonderful Vallejo color. It's what I use for most of my wood. 
and go straight over the entire thing. And then for all of the black details on the miniature, I'm going to use black gray. Now you can use a pure black for this, but I tend to find a very dark gray, whether it be this or Corvus black or something similar, it's just a little bit more visually interesting once it's shaded. And it will look black. So boots, uh, the little nozzle on his canister here, anything that's going to be black, go ahead. Now I'm going to turn to Dawnstone, which is a nice middling gray. Uh, uniform gray from the Army Painters, quite a good match for this. I'm going to go all over his cape, and I'm also going to paint this onto his gloves. Now, you could use a different gray if you want it on his gloves, but I figure by the time we're finished, he's going to look so different, it's not going to matter too much. Now when you're applying a base coat to a big area like this, try and keep your brush moving in the same direction wherever you can, and you'll find that you end up with a smoother finish once this dries. Now that will take a couple of coats to get a nice solid finish, uh, but once you're done, you will probably find all of the little bits of support you had failed to clean off, like I have, but oh well. Uh, what I'm going to use now is the Fang from Citadel. This is a nice deep blue with a little bit of a grayish tint to it. Makes a wonderful military blue sort of color. So straight over the helmet. That's most of the base coats done, but what we're going to do now is tweak the cape a little bit and get to painting the camo. What I have here is Silver Grey from Vallejo. This is a really very, very light grey, just off white, with a really faint beige-ish tint, which is going to work well for our military gear. I've worked most of this off onto a bit of kitchen towel, as you can see, and using a makeup brush, I'm very lightly touching at first, edges and corners, and uh, as I get a feel for what's on my brush, I'm going to slowly start bulking out some of these areas where I want to highlight without having to painstakingly paint in a highlight. So working this brush over the same area a few times, I can build that up. It just gives us a little bit more volume on our camo cape here. Now after a few passes, you'll have something that looks like this. And I like the textured surface that you get when you're dry brushing, particularly on capes and clothing and stuff like that. Some folks don't, and that's fair enough, but I think this adds a little bit of realism. That's really up to you. What I've got is a small flat edged brush. Um, I do wish I had a slightly smaller one, but we'll see how this goes. What I'm using here, this is dead white. This is a Vallejo gain color. This was recommended to me by a patron, so I'm giving it a shot to see what happens. What I'm going to do is start just laying down some vaguely rectangular shapes. Uh, back when Denison smocks were first being made for the Airborne and the SAS, uh, they were actually made by laying down sheets of fabric and painting across the top of them with brooms or whatever was to hand. So. Having a really, really gross and grimy and frankly terrible finish to your camo is thematically accurate. Uh, but what I'm going to do is just twist my brush back and forth. I want a fairly random pattern if I can manage it. Okay, now that looks properly garbage, but <laughs> that's exactly what I'm looking for here. Remember to take your camo pattern up past the edges of anything because if you keep stopping at the edges, it's going to look really unnatural. We want this to look as though a large piece of material was painted over and then trimmed. So keep going once you reach the edges. Now what I'm going to do, using the same color, is prep up my brush and start doing some little breakaway shapes. Still fairly squared, uh, but as though somebody was trying to make like a T-shape. So like... So on this bit here, and then this guy, I'll flip him upside down to make it a little bit easier to do this. And here we'll paint that T-shape like so. And yeah, I'm going to do this over most of these little bits of camo so that the shapes are all regularly irregular. What I'm going to do now is go back to our black gray from earlier and do something very similar. Start sketching out some rectangular blocks. 
And I want to start either close to or just starting to envelop the edges of our white blocks. So like so. And then same thing again, some little rectangular bits just jutting off the sides of these. And then finally you'll have something that looks a little more familiar. Now at that point, all of our base coats are done. If you need to go back and do any tidy up, now's the time to do it, because I've got here my shade. Now this is a mix, this is half and half Agrax Earthshade and Lamian Medium, because I still want the shading properties, but I don't want it to go as dark as it would be if I was using this neat. So I'm going to load up my brush, and we are going over everything. Make sure you're working it into the recesses, you know, sneaking into all those little bits and nooks and crannies. And then we'll leave this for about half an hour to dry. Now once that finally is dry, you're going to have something that looks a lot more reasonable. It's going to look pretty grubby, which I kind of want to lean into, but I like how that looks. What I've done here, this is field blue from earlier, the same uniform color, with just a tiny little dot of that silver gray mixed in. What we'll use this for is to highlight the uniform. You don't need very much of this. Just a few little splats and lines here and there to emphasize some of the high points of the clothing. Then for his webbing, in much the same way, I've gone back to the medium gray we started with and added just a tiny bit of that uh, silver gray. You could use ivory or even a white if you've got that lurking around, but the silver gray is just that right sort of faded uh, color, I think, to really make this work. And now we're going to flip them around, we're going back to the dry brush. I'm back to that silver grey again. And we're going to very lightly use this to pick out, particularly on the black and the grey, just head towards the edges and the corners, and get a little bit more volume in those folds again. Uh, don't worry about going over the white with this, because, well, it's not going to show up. You don't need to worry about uh, undoing all of that shading. Just a little bit of extra work here. I think is going to make this look a wee bit cooler. Now I'm noticing because this is so much blue, my poor camera is struggling a little bit with the color balance, but the photo at the end is going to look accurate, at the very least. You'll see, under the dry brush, we finally have that really grimy, very obviously homespun sort of feel to the gear, which I like. Now what we need is to finish off that very important detail of that bare finger, I have a tiny little dot of Cadian Flesh Tone that I'm going to add here. But of course, whatever skin tone you want to use is just fine. If you had his face exposed, well, you'd paint that too now. Then really, the last highlight I've got, this is Model Air Steel. Now, you can use this through an airbrush, of course, but it comes perfectly well off of a brush. And I'm going to use this for two things. First, I'm going to do just tiny little dips of this quite haphazardly on some areas of the helmet, so that it looks like chipping. The other thing I'm going to do is to paint in the rings on his uh, eyes, but I am going to do that off camera because goodness knows uh, I will not do a good job of that <laughs> with this in the way. Now, with that done, I'm going to apply a varnish. Now you could spray on a matte varnish, uh, but what I recommend, this is Instar's Varnish Plus. And it is a wonderful super matte finish, so I'm going to go over everything with this, making sure that it doesn't collect too heavily in any recesses. Now what a difference to the finish a varnish makes. Uh, protecting your work is not the only reason to varnish a miniature. Uh, whether you think it's necessary or not, it can really change up the finish, and that, I think, is a really great reason to give it a shot if you haven't before. Now, after having varnished it, I've got here a 2B pencil, something nice and soft, and I'm going to very lightly catch along the edge of any black metal work. Reason being is this will very quickly give us that nice buffed metallic edge uh, without having to painstakingly paint it. And now the last thing to do is to base this fella. Now, I've covered winter basing in another video, indeed the first British Rifleman video I did for these guys. Uh, the recipe for the dirt itself is going to be in the description, because it's very similar, and you've seen me use Valhalla Blizzard before. So, let's get a look at this dude once he's got his base on him, and he is all finished. 
And there at last, our Urban Operations British Rifleman is complete. And I had a blast painting him. In particular, I think the little things like the environmental effects and that final dry brush on his cape really bring together all of the little bits of work that we've done. Um, I might in the future... Now, personally, I do prefer a slightly more regimented and, dare I say, official-looking camo. Uh, but thinking back to how the very earliest sheets of camouflage material were made, well, it seemed appropriate to Gloom Trench. So, as always, thank you very much to Exit 23 Games for the light and sound equipment, as well as all of my wonderful patrons who are keeping me ticking in paints and glue, and resin, most importantly at the moment, <laughs> including all of the gorgeous producers that are showing up on screen now. Thank you very much to them. Now, any questions or anything, feel free to drop them in the old comment box below. My Twitter and Instagram are both linked there too. So, thank you very much for your time, and you all enjoy the rest of your day.